name is Bob Vanderpaul. I direct the Employee Assistance Program and has the honor of serving all of you. And uh, glad you came. I'm glad you came today. When I do things on uh, anger de escalation and conflict resolution, and uh, people show up 45 minutes early, it makes me nervous. So, uh, <laughs> but glad to serve you today. Really happy to be with you. Hope to give you some tips that can be helpful. And, uh, and you know, it's hard to be an employee and a person at the same time. A lot of times it's hard to be an employee and a person at the same time. But I hope some tips here help you both at work and in the rest of your life as well. Um, so let's talk about how do we diffuse the angry person. Must have been a uh, hot topic because the seats are full. So what I want to talk about is one, just getting a sense of, of what happens um, for you. I want to make sure that I scratch where it itches uh, with situations that uh, you're most likely to face. And then I just want to talk about what actually happens. When somebody gets angry, what happens to them? So I'm going to give you a real quick and dirty neuropsych lecture about what actually happens in people's bodies and brains that tend to make them really stupid. If I can say that on camera. But it tends to. None of us get smarter when we're angry. And then I want to talk to some about, okay, what are some techniques that have been helpful in taking somebody from here to here? And if we have time, we're going to practice just a little, little bit. Nothing, uh, nothing threatening. Nothing that uh, I'm, I'm the guy who always leaves the party when charades start, so I get it. I get it. But we want to give you just a chance to practice, perhaps as well. Okay? Everybody's in the right training. All right. Good. So let's let's talk about it. So you made a choice to come today. It wasn't because of free food. So my guess is that there's somebody in your mind right now. So if you were to picture in your brain an angry interchange that has happened that led you to come here instead of going out for a burger, um, I want you to picture that. I want you to get in touch with that. I want you to think about it. And then without sharing anybody's identity, especially if they're sitting next to you. But uh, what's something that you'd like to do different in that kind of situation, just really briefly? Did everybody have somebody's face pop into mind? Okay, I see lots of head nods and I see lots of people frantically avoiding eye contact with a presenter. Okay. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Well, we've all had it. We've all been here. We've all had somebody, sometimes it was a kid, sometimes it was somebody that you're serving, sometimes it's somebody at home. But I want you to think very clearly. Anybody willing to share just two sentences? What would you like to do different? Anything you'd like to learn? Anything at all? Yeah? Well, a lot of us here work for court. Yeah. They have a deal with the public. And They're angry when they walk in. A yes. Lot of times. Yeah. And if you've been here a while, you get used to it, and you know how to, you, it doesn't upset you when they're upset, because you're used to that. But what kind of gets me sometimes is people who are kind of passive aggressive and come in, and that, that bugs me more than yeah. that gets me. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So, going away from my spiffy slides, but that's a great comment, in that there's different ways that people can respond. If there's an issue between you and me, and we need to make a decision, are we going to McDonald's or Burger King? Okay? There's aggressive, which says, you don't matter. I do. What I want is what we do. Right? You probably, most of you came here because of having to deal with that. Then there's passive, which is, I don't count. You do. So whatever you want. Doesn't lead to real healthy conversations either, does it? And this person's got a stomach ache because they're saying that. And then there's passive aggressive, which you described, which is the same as aggression, it's just sneakier. And it's the same thing of I count, you don't, but I'll tell you whatever you want to hear so I can get my way and do whatever I want. Yeah, Mom, I'll clean my room by four. Sure. Right? You've heard that one before. And then there's assertive, which says, 
You count. I count. What you want, think and feel counts. So do mine. So let's put it right here and let's figure it out. Let's come up with take turns, compromise, or a whole new idea. Right? Okay. Yeah. If you want to tip people off, if you want to be the person who engenders a lot of aggression, passive aggression gets people madder than even aggression. So encourage the assertive approach instead. Okay, thanks. Any, uh, any other thoughts about what do I want to get from this based upon uh, an interchange that I've had? Okay, let's go. Let's go. So, let's talk about what happens when people get mad. So, most of the time, anger actually, and it helps me to be able to think about this. When I'm talking to somebody that's really going off and really being a jerk, okay, using real language here, it helps me to recognize the fact that researchers tell you that anger is actually a secondary emotion that usually comes out of hurt, fear, and sadness. And so sometimes when somebody's really going off, I try to picture them in my brain as, this is a scared little kid in a 250-pound body. This is somebody who's hurt. This is somebody who's been hurt. This is somebody who's sad. And if I think about hurt, fear, and sadness, it gives me a little more grace and helps me not to be a jerk back just a different default position. Because when we perceive a threat, and if I was coming to court, I'd perceive a threat. I'd perceive a threat financially, legally, shame, convenience, lots and lots of threats. But when we perceive a threat, whether it's danger to us or the threat of losing something precious to us, we respond just like animals do when a threat presents itself to them. So depending upon the species of the animal and the nature of the threat, they choose fight or flight or freeze, right? And so you can see, if I'm a tiger, I have all three options. If I'm a deer, it's probably going to be flight first because I'm fast. Freeze works pretty well sometimes. They don't fight very often, but they can. Whatever that is probably doesn't fight much. <laughs> looks pretty frozen, right? They're best off just hiding. We do the same thing. And if on Sunday mornings you've heard the phrase, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, it's going to mean something totally different to you now. <coughs> because instantly our brains and bodies start to work very, very differently in a way to keep us safer. So if a civilian came in and started to yell at you, there's a really, really good chance that your fingers and toes get cold. Anybody experienced that before you have a tough conversation, a solo uh, performance appraisal? Did you ever notice that your fingers and toes get cold? Okay, some of you nodded yes, some of you are powerful superheroes. All right. <laughs> we do. Because our brains and bodies instantly, without us even to think about it, have decided that, you know, if a threat's present, even though it's not a, a, a dangerous threat or not, but even when, when we think a threat is present, our brains and bodies say, we need to change the flow of blood in this person's body. And so the blood vessels to your extremities, to your fingers and your toes, clamp down and restrict blood flow. Because fine motor dexterity is not important when you have to fight or take flight. And blood now goes in expanded blood vessels. It goes to your central core and especially to the quick twitch muscles in your major muscle groups in your chest, your arms, and your legs. So you can fight, take flight, and freeze better. It also knows that you need to be a lean, mean, fight machine. And so it begins to dump chemicals and to change things that happen in your bloodstream. So if anybody has worked on engines in your life, you know that they need three things. They need fuel, they need spark, and they need oxygen, right? So when you go to Valvoline to get your oil changed, they check your fuel filter, your spark plugs, and your air filter because that all needs to happen for the motor to go. Our cells are the same. So first they need fuel. Instantly, when we're shocked by something, 
when we perceive a threat, adrenaline and cortisol, noradrenaline, and a whole bunch of more chemicals and, and hormones get dumped into our system that actually make us faster and stronger. So when you're under a good adrenaline rush, you could run faster or bench press more for a short period of time. That happens. Um, you need spark. So if you ever noticed when you're scared, you kind of get that sense of jumping outside your skin like your cells are going. Quick acting sugar is dumped into your system and that's what creates that tightness. And we need oxygen, so we mass, mass, mass produce by the hundreds of thousands red corpuscles which send oxygen to all those cells. So we're now like this. We're ready to go. We're ready to go. There's also changes that happen inside your brain. Little electricians running around connecting and disconnecting wires to make you mission critical ready. So if you've ever really been shocked, you perhaps notice you tend to lose peripheral vision. When I work with your sheriffs, we talk about that. When you're in a scary situation, you need to make sure your head's on a swivel because you now lock in and you get tunnel vision. You may experience that with the people that are hostile, that are angry. And eyes are now acutely attuned to anything that moves. To anything that moves, because that could be the next threat. So somebody could be trying to talk to you, and if they're hostile, but anything is moving behind you, it's like you got an ADD kid on a monster drink at Chuck E. Cheese's, okay? But it's there. Um, hearing gets a bit muffled for most people when they're really losing it, when they're really angry, really frightened. But what they will pick up is any change in cadence or rhythm around them. They'll be very distracted by things like if the furnace or the air conditioner kicks on because it was changed. That could be another threat. Since the smell gets better, taste gets worse. Now, another thing that happens, and this is the part that makes it difficult to communicate with somebody who's really, really angry. So one, they're like a deer during hunting season, eyes big, ears up, nostrils flared, muscles tense, losing it, hearts racing, blood pressure's up. But the brain works differently. It gets connected differently. So the part of your brain that makes you all so incredibly intelligent is found right here. It's called your frontal cortex. It's right behind your forehead. That's the smartest and the slowest part of your brain. That's the part of your brain that takes in multiple sources of information, is able to multitask, is able to think abstractly, to think about thinking, and to make a decision. For almost everybody, under the influence of traumatic stress or under the influence of anger, they get dumb. Almost everybody. Almost everybody gets dumber. That part of the brain isn't working. What's working now is the most primitive animal part of your brain. It's called the amygdala, and that's the part of your brain that goes. It's quick. It's reactive. It's self-serving. It's protective of self. So if you and I were in a boxing match, sir, and I threw a left hook, that would be a really bad time for your frontal cortex to ponder the history and philosophy of pugilism. Right? That would be a part for the dumbest part of your brain that's been well trained by repetition, repetition, repetition to block the punch. Okay? That's the part of the brain that's working. It's the part of the brain that is me, 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 me. It's the part of the brain that is very emotional. It's self-serving. It's black and white. And it has, it's linear. It believes one thing caused one thing. Unfortunately, you may be the one thing that's causing all the pain. But they're not going to think fairly. They're not going to hear logic and reason. That part of the brain isn't there at that moment, if it ever is. Okay? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Kind of makes sense. Kind of makes sense. So, if I'm really losing it, and you talk to me, and you use big words and long sentences with lots of commas, and you try to be reasonable and talk about the general welfare of the people of Ottawa County, 
That's Swahili to me. That's Swahili to me. I'm thinking me right now. Because that's part of my brain that's working. And I may tend to do that anyway. Um, there's a very, very, very small percentage of folks who actually do get smarter when they're really emotionally on edge, but it's a small, small percentage. Um, when you look at your law enforcement, firefighters, soldiers, um, I wish the Lions quarterback all the time, actually get smarter. But one of the goals of the training for those, those professions is repetition, 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 drill, 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 so that you instantly make brilliant decisions out of the dumbest part of your brain. Okay? Your citizens have not had that kind of training. They may have had the kind of training where the only way that I'm safe is if I'm angry. And the repetition and the drill, drill, drill has been, I'm in greater danger if I don't protect myself. My best defense is a good offense. And that may be the way that many of them are wired. They may have learned my only choice is fight. Some of them will take flight, some of them will freeze, but some fight, don't they? So that's where it's coming from. Very few people get smarter when they feel threatened. So it's how do we now work through all that's happening in their personality, the rest of what's going on in their life, and all this biochemistry that's happening that makes them very difficult to have an intelligent conversation with. Another thing that happens too is, I don't know, you folks look human too. So, sometimes think about, oops, that's me too. I do the same thing. Darn. So, there's a tendency for me to get dumber too. And there's a tendency for me to say stuff that I'd regret later, or to come across in ways that I don't know because I'm fighting, or taking flight, or freezing. So, we're going to learn a little bit about ourselves in this process, too. So, you're familiar with these. These are the signs that somebody's losing it. And again, think about Think about all that's happening with the cortisol and the noradrenaline and the sugar and everything. So, people get, get louder. They tend to talk faster. Their voice tends to go up an octave. Everybody becomes a tenor when they're ticked off. You don't very often hear somebody angry with bass voice. They at least go up to baritone. So that's something to for. Fidgeting because they're just moving, because that sugar's there, shaking, needing to move. When you see bald fists, it's trying to gain some sense of control. Sometimes it means they're ready to punch, sometimes it doesn't. Erratic movement, gesturing, pacing, aggressive posture. Right? You've seen those, those are scary. You see those. It's a good idea to see those early. It's a good idea to see those early rather than later, but to be alert and, and aware of them. Just one, I'm going to start out with the dumbest thing to say, and it's also a very common thing to say. When somebody's really losing it and somebody says, calm down, duh. Does that ever work for anybody here? Has that ever worked at home? But it's a, it's a natural thing to say, doesn't it? But if I'm perceiving a threat, and I'm experiencing all that, and somebody says, calm down, I just sparked the bomb. So catch yourself. I bet we've all done it. I bet we've all done it. And its batting average is zero. So I'm going to start there. Let's think about, when we think about angry people, we tend to think about them. We think about how they're presenting. Here's that hostile person. It's important to think a little bit about, wait a minute, what do they experience when they see me? What do they see, what do they experience when they see me? What am I bringing to the party? How do I react when people get in my face? What's my tendency? Do I fight? Do I take flight? Do I freeze? How do I tend to respond? So it's good to be aware of yourself. So this is called the Johari window, and it just has different quadrants of self-awareness. So for this one, 
<clears throat> the white one. Um, Stephanie knows she's wearing a white blouse, and we all know it too. Okay? Next one. Known to self, but not to others. So this could be things, Stephanie knows her password, we don't. Stephanie knows her husband's middle name, we don't. Stephanie could have wonderful things about herself that she knows and we don't. Maybe she's got deep, dark, dirty secrets. We don't know, but she does. Okay? That quadrant. Then there's this one. I want to move off Stephanie on this one. There's also things about ourselves that we don't know, and nobody else does either. So it could be that Bob has a tumor that's going to be diagnosed next week. That would fall here. Now we're getting to the creepy one. Did you know that every single one of us has stuff that we don't know about ourselves, but everybody else does? That quiets the crowd, doesn't it? So about every single one of us, somebody could say, oh yeah, he, he. and we go, do I really? And everybody else goes, yeah. Could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, could be something in between. But we all have that. So, how many accidents don't happen on Highway 31 because somebody changed lanes and somebody was in their blind spot? Right? We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. So, if we can learn a little more about our blind spots, we may avoid some accidents when we're trying to talk to somebody who's angry. Yeah. So, if you have people in your life that you trust, who will give you good feedback, who will both tell you that you have a beautiful smile and when you have spinach in your teeth. Those are people that can help you learn a little more about yourself and maybe come across a little different. Because when we get stressed, when we get stressed, think about this one. So, has anybody gone to the county fair and been brave enough to sit down for a caricature artist? Anybody ever done that? Okay. A bunch of cowards in this room. Sorry. Or smart cowards. A bunch of smart cowards. Those guys are brutal, right? They will pick one feature that may be a little abnormal or unique and bah! So if you kind of have big ears, now you're Dumbo. If you kind of have a big nose, now you're Squidward, right? That's what they do. But they make it recognizable, but they make you a caricature. When we are really agitated, we become caricatures of ourselves. So if I tend to be detail-oriented, when I become agitated, even though I may care, I'm going to come across as... <clears throat> well, the protocols are, the bottom line is, and these are the policies and procedures we need to follow. Now, all of those things may be true. But if I'm talking to somebody who's ticked off, I just made them matter, didn't I? If I tend to be more feeling-oriented, I may melt. And when people are coming to you, they it probably feels safer to them than if you got on their face. But we're not getting any business done here. If I tend to talk a lot under stress, I'm going to talk a real lot. If I tend to be kind of quiet, I'm going to tend to be more mute. If I tend to be decisive, I may be bossy. If I tend not, I may become too passive. If I have a nervous giggle, I'll drive people crazy. Right? Haven't you noticed that in stressful situations? Think of the last funeral, family reunion, class reunion you went to. People kind of became more of what they already were. That happens when we're trying to talk to somebody when they're angry and we're anxious about it too. It's a good to know what's, what do I tend to do that may be getting me in trouble that everybody else would say, yeah, when things get really stressful, you get real bossy. <coughs> or you disappear. Nobody can find you. That could be helpful in defusing somebody. Now, de-escalating. It's impossible to talk to an angry person. Your goal is to try to 
to get them calmed down enough to where you can have that conversation. It's all very counterintuitive. We kind of think, if I was just logical, if I just present facts, if I just do this, but again, a lot of times if somebody's really losing it, we're not dealing with this part of the brain. It's also true, so anybody here parents? Okay, how many of you have said, my kids don't hear a word I say? You are absolutely right, <clears throat> especially when they're agitated, but they watch, right? They watch. So when fight, flight, freeze kicks in, the content of the words that you say become less and less and less and less important. How you say them becomes more and more and more important. Remember I said we're dealing with kind of the animal part of the brain? So if anybody here's got a dog, you know, you can say, come here, you stupid, ugly mutt. Right? And they come and jump right in your lap. Right? The content of the words didn't mean anything. It was the rest of how you did it. People become more that way when they become agitated. Don't call them stupid, ugly mutts under any context, but you know what I mean. So they're going to be watching, they're going to be paying attention, and a lot of what you need to do is how can I create an environment that's firm but safe while they have a chance to settle a bit. Your sheriff's department will tell you that if they're in a hostage situation, their best friend is time. So they stall, install, install and get people to talk because that makes it move from the dumb part of the brain to the smart part of the brain. And they give them water and they give them Jimmy John's trying to get their body chemistry back to normal and they do everything to stall because then people are less likely to make a fight response. Some of that's true for you as well. So the first and only objective in de-escalation is to try to get them less agitated so that discussion becomes somewhat possible. Hard to do when you have a long line of people waiting to meet with you. I, mean, I get it. It's also true that the escalation is doesn't make sense. So fight, flight, freeze. So if a, somebody bigger than you comes at you, flight makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Can't do that in your job all the time. Sometimes, but not always. It's also true that many times we're taught that if somebody comes at us aggressively, anybody here play football? If somebody comes at you aggressively, you match their aggression and hopefully overpower their aggression. So that's the flight, the fight part, right? That's the fight part. How's that working for you? That'll get you fired, right? So can't do that one. So it's it seems very much inherently abnormal not to fight or to take flight or to freeze. But the escalation techniques, again, just it's important to remain centered so the other person has a chance to walk down. Let's go to some skills. So one, cooling off again, We're talking about time, time, give them a chance. Are there ways that the person can be stalled? Are there ways that the person can sit? Are there ways that the person can do this? Now, for some people, they're gonna be more ticked because now you're making them wait. You have to make a judgment call there, but for many people, a timeout, not a punitive timeout, but time while we do paperwork and talk about stuff is helpful. It's helpful to listen. There are no brilliant things to say that will calm somebody down at this point. We already said, don't say calm down. Right? But for you to listen to them, and for you to listen to them in a way where they know you're listening. Again, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So for you to make eye contact, for you to be totally present with them, for you to have a pleasant face, for you to be paying attention, for you to use words that they used with you, <coughs> Tone them down a bit. Um, it's a really, really good idea oftentimes also to have a hubbub going on, and especially if there's an audience. 
because if they've already been stupid and now they calm down in front of their peers or people that they're trying to impress, um, they lose face and they have a lot invested in staying ticked off. <coughs> At that point, it feels like I have to win. So if you can move them to some scenario where there's not an audience, it tends to work a lot better. It tends to work lots better. Ask your sheriffs about that. There's some other ones. First one sounds stupid, but it's really important. Don't forget to breathe. So there's a difference when we're feeling threatened by a hostile person. Our fight, flight, freeze kick. <coughs> and we have a tendency to come out of the dumbest part of our brain, and that's the difference between react and respond. React is what you do without thinking, and respond is what you do with thought. Okay? Don't forget to breathe. Think back to elementary school science. We all learned that there's a certain um, element that we're addicted to that we need with every breath, right? What is it? Oxygen. Okay, good. O2. We all need oxygen. When oxygen comes in, it immediately goes through the systems and to the cells, and the cells relax because they're getting enough oxygen. We're addicted to oxygen. Don't breathe for 30 seconds and see if your anxiety goes up. It will, right? Especially if somebody else is restricting that flow. And then there's a compound that happens through the chemical interchange in our cells that we need to get out of our system, carbon dioxide, correct? Okay? So our brain is constantly reading the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in our system. If we take a good, deep, cleansing breath when we're afraid, and think about it. what do people do right before they sing a solo, right before they get a tee shot or shoot a free throw, right? From the diaphragm, tummy goes out when you inhale. Because if you breathe shallowly, if you breathe from your chest, you're sucking carbon dioxide right back into your system, which your brain interprets the same way as if you were drowning or being suffocated. So if you don't breathe, your anxiety produces greater anxiety, which makes you less likely to engage the smart part of your brain and to respond well. Interesting. Huh? So don't forget to breathe. Don't forget to breathe. Two, be non-defensive. Don't take it personally. That's a hard one. Um, I was training in Grand Rapids Police Department, <clears throat> and one of the officers said a technique that I use all the time I use all the time is uh, when somebody's just really going off and being stupid, I'll walk up to them and I'll try to have as inquisitive look as I can on my face. And I'll look them in the eye and I'll just say, are you mad at me? And he says, it's amazing. 90 some percent of the time, I'll go, no, no, I'm just mad because whatever. And it just took an edge off. So it's important to realize these people may have been mad their whole lives. They may have been mad because of the system. They may be mad at themselves. But under, out of the dumb part of the brain, they need a target for their anger, and you just happen to be there. Don't take it personally. I don't think any one of you are responsible solely for the system or how long it takes or what the policies are. Don't take responsibility for them. That helps to lower your own anxiety so you can respond better. Um, it's important to ask questions. It's important to, when people are really agitated, when people are really angry, they want to be heard and understood. Right? Isn't that true of you? It is me. When I'm ticked, I want somebody to hear me, I want them to understand and at least acknowledge. Even if they disagree and I don't get my way, darn it, at least I was respected. So it's important to ask questions, but just make sure you do it because I want to understand your problem. Help me understand. So can you give me the details on this? Can you do this? What that also does, without them knowing it, is that as they talk, for most people that takes stuff out of the dumb part of your brain and re-engages the smarter part of your brain. So just make sure that as you ask the questions, they don't feel challenged, they don't feel interrogated, but they feel like I've got somebody who's trying to understand 
and that also helps. The next one is one of my favorites, it's, and it's hard sometimes, because sometimes people are really out there, but to try to find something healthy in their anger. Not, not that long ago, I was at a uh, construction accident where someone was killed. It was very traumatic and very scary, and people were all over the map. People were crying, people were a million miles stare, people were down here, people were all over the place. And one guy expressed it by just being ticked. And he was ranting and raving, this place doesn't care about us, we don't have lousy safety practices, our boss just wants a bigger yacht, da 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 And he was really disrupting the rest of the crowd and kind of pouring fire on everybody else, or gasoline on everybody else's fire, whichever direction they were going. And um, I might just said, you know, sir, you're really concerned about the safety of your coworkers. I respect that. And just finding that little toehold, it was like, okay, he had a little respect. Somebody understood him. Even though he was being a knucklehead, somebody found something healthy, and it helped to take him down a bit. So trying to find something smart, something good, something valuable in the midst of a whole lot of hooey can give you that, that toehold. Okay. Um, focus on, is there a mission? Is there a goal we can work on together? People may not get everything they want. They may not get their child support reduced. They may not get the visitation they want. They may not have their ticket thrown away, whatever it is that you're dealing with. They may not get what they want from the halls of justice. But is there something that you can work on together? Instead of focusing on what you can't, is there something that you can accomplish together and they feel that you're teamed up with them? For many people, it's scary being that angry. They're angry because they're scared, and then it's scary being angry. And if you can bring that down, it helps. And then I talked about how the content of your words aren't that important. In normal conversation, researchers tell us that the content of the words that you say are about 16% of all the messages sent, and all the rest are the nonverbals. So my double negative up there is intentional. You cannot not communicate. I'm doing all the talking right now, but you folks are communicating back with me in a variety of ways too. And as I mentioned before, when somebody's brain is firing in an agitated state, the words you say become less and less and less important. How you say it becomes more and more and more important because of the, the way they're thinking and the threat that they perceive. So, yes, your actions speak louder than words. Listen, get them to talk, even though sometimes like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Let them talk as time allows. And I'm going to argue for that. Spending an extra 10 minutes with somebody who's doing this may save you hours later. <laughs> Sometimes it's pay me now or pay me later, isn't it? Just is. Um, be present. It's really hard when we have iPhones, but don't be texting somebody else while you're talking to this person. <coughs> Tune in. If you roll your eyes, if you look at somebody else, if you're looking at the next person in line while they're there, they're going to be acutely attuned to pick up any signs that you don't give a rip about. And the folks who tend to go quickest to anger from hurt and fear and sadness usually have long life histories of not being taken seriously. You're not the first person. In fact, when they're angry with you, they're probably angry at a long line of parents and teachers and coaches and bosses that they didn't feel took them seriously. And so they're going to be acutely attuned to being tuned out again. For you to take them seriously, it's probably a pretty big deal for them. Take the time, again, think about how they see you. That can be a blind spot. <clears throat> I used to own a company, and my, my CFO was this great big guy who was kind of intimidating anyway just because of his size. But when he was thinking, was we'd be in a staff meeting, and somebody would share an idea, his, he would always go, and sometimes people would be really intimidated by that and stop being creative until they realized that he'd go, you don't 
that's a great idea. And then we could do this and this and this and this. That was just the way he listened. So we did a little coaching with him. Hey, you're scaring, you're scaring the team here. Can you at least try to have a neutral face while you're thinking? But think about how do you present yourself? How do people see you fight or flight or freeze? Some other things. We talked about breathing already. Did you know that therapists learned in, in shrink school that the way that we talk with people can actually lower their blood pressure, we can slow their pulse by the way that we talk with them. And so if you have, or you can escalate it if you need to. Those are a little more fun. But if someone's anxious, if you talk a little slower, a little lower in timber, <coughs> you breathe diaphragmatically. If you use some of the words that they've already used with you, if, without being stupid, you mirror some of the motions that they make, they put a little monitor on people's fingertips and find out that it drops. So the key is to do that in a way that still says, I care about you, I'm listening, I'm taking your issue seriously and not coming across as apathetic or passive. But if you can control yourself in that way, just like anger is contagious, so is calm. Calm usually wins. Calm comes across this because if I'm really agitated and I'm getting in your face and you remain calm, it's like, holy smoke, what's going on here? I don't understand this. Other people fight or take flight and she's staying right here and staying calm with me. She must be stronger than I am. Nonetheless. Some other things. Yes, be calm, self assured the location we talked about. Um, eye contact is important, but not if they feel stared at. 